The political history of Europe was mostly shaped by two phenomena, large consolidated kingdoms and empires on the one hand and migratory movements from the north and east on the other. While the former is well known to the public, the many migrations, especially from Asia, are rarely talked about if we leave out the Hans of Attila. Seemingly, after the disintegration of the Hunnic Empire, the migrations by steppe peoples lost importance. But as a matter of fact, the dissolution of the Huns paved the way for even more migrations. Beginning in the 550s, many steppe peoples like the Avars, Göktürks, Bulgars, Pechenegs and Kipchaks entered the European continent. In between, a particular group called Magyars also entered Europe. They would go on to form the core of Hungarian identity. The Magyars' early history was marked by interactions with Turkic empires, shaping their cultural and political development and even writing system. Passing through modern-day Ukraine, they arrived in the Carpathian Basin, the former home of the Huns. There, the Magyars developed their language, customs and governance with noticeable Turkic and Iranic influences. This era saw the rise of important Magyar leaders and the establishment of a distinct political entity. One of the most important leaders was Arpad, who successfully conducted this conquest and founded the eponymous Arpad dynasty. Later, Istvan's conversion to Christianity and establishment of the Kingdom of Hungary were monumental in solidifying the Magyar presence in Europe. The subsequent history of the Hungarians is well known, but the era of the ancient Magyars is often overlooked and complicated. It is now time to shed light on these nomadic steppe warriors and establish some facts. First, we'll explain the geographical origins of the first Magyar tribes and try to understand why they migrated in the first place. Then, we will delve into early Magyar culture and analyze if and how much it had in common with the Finno-Ugric, Iranic and Turkic cultures. We'll see how Magyar and Hungarian identity changed over time and we'll lastly answer the question if the Hungarians, as the name suggests, really are descendants of the Huns of Attila. Shout out to all of our supporters on YouTube and Patreon who made this video possible. Before we dive into ancient Magyar history, we need to clear up a few misconceptions. The country that is called Hungary in English is actually called Magyarorzag, which means land of the Magyars in Hungarian to this day. This term stems from the ancient Magyars that this video is all about. But the origin of the name Hungary, in turn, is more complicated. In academia, there is consensus about it originating from the old Greek naming convention for the Onagur Federation, Aungroi. This was a state that harbored not only but especially Turkic-speaking tribes like the Kutrigurs, Utigurs, Saragurs, and Bulgars in the 5th and 6th centuries. In the Annales Bertiniani, written in Carolingian France in 862, the term Ungri was used. This was most certainly used to describe the Magyar tribes, not a geographical location per se. On the other hand, Byzantine Emperor Leo the Wise used the term Turk whenever referring to the Magyars after they had entered the Onagur territory in the 8th century. Other scholars of the early medieval period used similar or completely different names for one and the same people. Furthermore, the Magyars were referred to being Huns several times in historical documents. One example is this Anglo-Saxon world map, where the Kingdom of Hungary is coined as Hunarum Gines in Latin, the Hun people. We will come back to the theory of the Hungarians being descendants of the Huns later on. First, we want to find out where the Magyar tribes used to live in ancient times, possibly even before any Hun entered the European continent. This was certainly not in modern-day Hungary, and some naming conventions are indeed helpful for locating this original homeland. The Arab historian Al-Masudi, for example, called the Magyars Bazkirda, which is eerily similar to the term Bashkir, 
a Turkic people that live in the modern Republic of Bashkortostan in Russia. There is a theory that in the 5th century BC, Herodot referred to the same area when writing about the Yugra people west of the Ural Mountains. Bashkortostan is located only a bit further south. This region that encompasses the Ural Mountains is known as Magna Hungaria, Great Hungary, in reference to the homeland of the Magyar tribes before their emigration. While this term was first used in the 13th century, in the High Middle Ages, there is some truth to locating the Magyars so far to the east of modern Hungary. There are several major theories regarding the origin of the Magyars, and them having been part of larger cultural groups of prehistorical and ancient times. The first and most prominent is the theory of Finno-Ugric affiliation. According to this proposition, the Magyars used to be a Finno-Ugric tribal federation that can be traced back to 2000 BC in the aforementioned Volga-Ural area. They lived alongside other Finno-Ugric people like the ancestors of the Finns and Laps. What supports this theory is, first and foremost, the language of the Hungarians. Hungarian and Finnish are two languages that belong to the Uralic language group. The Ugric division comprises Hungarian and the Ob Ugric languages Mansi and Kanti. The Finnic division is composed of five groups, among which the Baltic Finnic group consists of Finnish, Estonian, Karelian, including Olenets, Ludic, Veps, Ingrian, Livonian, and Votic. Like the other Uralic languages, Hungarian is agglutinative, meaning it forms words and expresses grammatical relationships through the addition of prefixes and suffixes. Hungarian also employs vowel harmony, a phonological process common in Uralic, but also the so-called Altaic languages, where the vowels within a word harmonize to be either all front or all back vowels. Hungarian also uses a case system that is extensively developed with around 18 cases used for expressing spatial and other relationships, a complexity mirrored in several other Uralic languages. These are not traits found in the surrounding Indo-European languages, which makes Hungarian a language isolate in Central Europe. The Altaic theory, once popular in the 19th and especially 20th century, tried to establish a connection between the Finno-Ugric and Hungarian languages in Europe and the Turkic, Mongolic, Japonic, and Koreanic languages in Asia. It has been negated by several linguists since, but we will perhaps witness the revival of the Altaic theory in the next five, 10 years, which brings us to another theory about Hungarian origins that we need to consider. The second theory proposes a Central Asian origin, so further east and south. While there is very little admixture of Finno-Ugric DNA among the Hungarians, a genetic analysis of King Bela III who was king of Hungary and Croatia in the 12th century, harbored some interesting results. According to scientists who published their findings in 2021, the Y chromosome of Bella belongs to haplogroup R1A Z21123. This in turn is today found in highest frequency in Central Asia, supporting a Central Asian origin for the ruling lineage of the Hungarian kingdom. The autosomal DNA profile, however, falls within the genetic variation of present-day East European populations. The typical Central Eastern European ancestry among Bella might be best explained by consecutive intermarriage with local European ruling families. But how significant is the connection between the Magyars and the Turkic peoples on a genetic level? A very noticeable link exists between the Magyars of Hungary and the Magyars in Kazakhstan. This is a Turkic group of only a few thousand people who reside in northwestern Kazakhstan, near the Ural Mountains. Interestingly, aside from the coincidental nature of sharing very similar sounding names, a study revealed the frequency of 12 STR haplogroup that was dominant among the Magyars in other countries. The researchers found almost no presence among the rest of the Kazakh population, but the frequency among Hungarians was at 4.2%. The striking result was that the population genetically closest to the Magyars was the Magyars. The Magyars in Kazakhstan are closer to the geographically distant Magyars than to their geographical neighbors. 
With that in mind, the Turkic genetic link among Hungarians is low, but it is noticeable. Research regarding the genetic affiliation of the people in Hungary today identified a range of 5% to 7% of Central and Inner Asian admixture. This suggests a minor but still notable presence of mostly Turkic lineage. Interestingly, the Hungarians had the lowest admixture, with 5%, while the Sekler had the highest, with 7.4%. In another genetic study conducted in 2008, the results served as a reminder that genetic admixture in Central Asia was massively shaped by westward migrations by peoples who mostly spoke a Turkic language, like the Huns, Hephthalites, and Ogres. During and after their expansions, Turkic and later Mongolic populations contributed to the gene pool of many local populations thereby creating genetic links between previously isolated groups like the Samoyed people in Siberia. A third theory proposes admixture with Iranic and Turkic populations, and later with Avar, Slav, and Germanic peoples in the Carpathian Basin. This theory is interconnected to the idea of a multi-ethnic medieval Hungary, which would explain the complex ethnic makeup of most of the Magyars in the medieval era. But this idea does not contradict the theory of a Central Asian and or Finno-Ugric origin. If we try to build a bridge that would connect all of these theories, we can come to the following conclusion. The Magyars most likely did originate in the region between the Volga River and the Ural Mountains. Either there or after leaving their homeland, they experienced significant interactions with Turkic and Iranic people, which also led to a mixture. After arriving in Europe and settling in the Carpathian Basin, even more mixture with the already local populations was inevitable. On a linguistic level, Magyars belonged to the Finno-Ugric sphere. On a genetic level, they certainly mixed with the Turks. On a political level, though, the Magyars were very much distinct from all other groups. The migration from Magna Hungary to the West serves as an entry point to medieval Magyar history. The abandonment of the Ural Mountains probably occurred in the 5th century AD. By this time, they had interacted with the Andronovo culture to the south and the Transbaikal and Altaic culture, which the Turkic peoples had dominated. They moved on to the region of modern Bashkortostan and most likely stayed here for several centuries. It is important to note that at the same time, the Hunnic Empire was reigning supreme in Europe. The Hephthalites were dominant in southern Central Asia, and the Ruran Khaganat, ruled by a Mongolic dynasty, controlled most of the eastern steppe belt. The Magyars were now in close proximity to three significant empires, but politically autonomous as the Hunnic realm did not reach further than the Volga River. The Hephthalite realm reached only as far as Sogdia, and the Ruran never crossed Lake Balkash. In this somewhat secure environment, Mahajar culture most likely thrived. Then, in the year 552, the ruling dynasty of the Ruran was overthrown by the Gukturk Ashina tribe and fled westward, thereby overrunning the Onagur Federation and everything in between. This had prompted a variety of nomadic tribes to move westward themselves, including the Magyars, who were now dwelling in the Ponto-Caspian area. After the Battle of Bukhara in 560, the Guk Turks took control of most of Central Asia, with their territory slowly expanding up to the Dnieper in Ukraine. In the inscriptions of the Guk Turks, the Magyars are not recorded, but it is in this era that Turkic culture massively impacted Magyar culture. There are several hundred Hungarian words of Turkic origin that were borrowed from other, mostly Oguric Turkic peoples. The names of several deities, as well as personal names, also show Turkic influence. It is likely that this cultural transmission occurred in three steps. First, during the Magyar's presence in Bashkortostan, then, while being under Gokturk rule, and lastly, but most importantly, during their second migration into modern-day Ukraine. As the Gokturk Empire collapsed in 630, new states emerged between Kazakhstan and the Avar Kingdom in Europe. 
This includes Great Bulgaria and the Hazar Empire, which we talked extensively about in the past. In between, the Majars came into intensive contact with their neighbors. As chroniclers from the greater surrounding area started noticing the Majar tribes, they used one particular term that has caused headaches until this very day. Turk. However, as the term Turk was being applied to a variety of peoples that emerged out of the Gokturk Empire, without taking into account their actual ethnicity. This should be taken into account, but with caution, nonetheless. An aspect that is very important for our understanding of steppe peoples, or really any ethnic groups, is their culture. This encompasses both cosmology and religious beliefs, as well as secular traditions, the rule of law, societal order, and so on. In the case of the Mahjars, the equestrian lifestyle was dominant. They had expertise in horse breeding, which is characteristic of many Eurasian steppe peoples. Their society was organized as a tribal federation, crucial for their mobility and adaptability in their migrations and conquests. Constantine VII, emperor of the Byzantines at the time of the Magyar's arrival in the Carpathian Basin, wrote about the so-called seven chieftains of the Magyars. This indicated that the term Magyar detailed a tribal federation of seven closely related tribes, which indeed can be validated by archaeological findings of villages and towns that correspond to these very tribes. Their early religious beliefs included elements of animism and shamanism, typical of Eurasian nomadic cultures. We don't know if Tengrism, the dominant state religion of the Gokturks and present among other peoples in the steppe, had ever been prevalent among the Majars. But we can certainly spot some elements of Tengrism that appeared in the Carpathian Basin after their arrival. For example, several deities of Tengrism also appear in Majar mythology. Among them is Erlik, here depicted as an evil creature of the underworld. The Hungarians call him Erdog. Two other deities are Hold Atya and Nap Anya, the Moon Father and Sun Mother, respectively. These correspond to Ai Ata and Gun Ana of Turkic Tengrism. But Tengrism does, as many of our viewers know, also share ancient shamanist elements. The shaman was called Kam among the Turks. In the case of the Majars, the Taltos takes the place of the Kam, being able to make use of supernatural powers. The Gunchul was a variant being able to communicate with animals and read the night sky. Important for the Majars was their belief in a three-world cosmology. In their understanding, the world was divided into three worlds. An upper world with the deities and other creatures present, the underworld of Erdog, and the middle world in between, home to humans, but also supernatural beings. To be fair, this three-world cosmology is not only central to Tengrism, but also to Norse cosmology. Here is an overview of the cosmology of Norse, Majar, and Turkic peoples. Aside from using different names, the similarities are astounding. The Majars had a very large canon of deities, mythological creatures, and folklore heroes. Much of the cosmology was codified in the Erdi Codex in the 16th century, written in ancient runic letters. This script, known as Old Hungarian, bears striking similarities to the Germanic runes in Scandinavia and the Orkhon script of the Turks in Central Asia. As most runic inscriptions were written on hard surfaces, such as stone or wood, curved lines are difficult to inscribe on such surfaces. The result is a very similar writing style. So to be fair, we must point out that many runic scripts look alike. Here are some examples from ancient Italy under Etruscan rule. 
Nonetheless, the similarities between Old Turkic and Old Hungarian letters are very intriguing. The Hungarians call their script Sekler Rovas, and this very script was used in an area that encompasses the Ponto-Caspian steppe and the Pannonian Basin. It is, in fact, likely that the Onagur people, including the Bulgars as well as the Hazars and Alans, used variants of this script. But who used it first? As the Old Turkic script first appeared in the Gokturk empires from the 6th to 8th centuries in East Asia, we can assume that it found its way to these very people due to Turkic expansion. Thus, it seems logical that the Majars adopted this script for their own society. Simon of Kaza in the 13th century remarked that the Sekler had adopted their runic script from the Bulaks. The Bulaks, in turn, were a Turkic tribe at the Altai Mountains, influential in the defense of the Gukturk empires against Chinese invasions. Whatever the case, all ancient, medieval, and contemporary historians agree on one assumption. The history of the Majars was massively shaped by migrations. Long and tedious migrations, which occurred over several centuries. This is a common trait among almost all steppe peoples, which appeared in the sources of their sedentary neighbors in China, Persia, ancient Rome, and Greece. If anything, the aforementioned admixture of Turkic elements in the Hungarian population likely occurred over this long time span, reflecting historical movements and interactions of people across Western Eurasia. But when and why did the Magyars leave Magna Hungary? How did they conquer the Pannonian Basin? A quick intermission for the sponsors of today's video. All members. The supporters on YouTube membership and over on patreon.com slash then. All members regularly receive exclusive behind the scenes footage, updates and early access to my videos. So after you have finished this video, consider joining too, either here or on Patreon. My next book, Empire of the Gökturks, is also almost finished, so keep an eye out. That being said, let's continue with the Majar's journey to kingship. After analyzing the origins and culture of the ancient Majars, it is now time to explore their political history, which began to shape in late antiquity, like that of many interesting steppe peoples. At that time, the only traditional power in Eurasia, Byzantium, was pressured by Germanic kingdoms in the west of Europe. Simultaneously, various steppe peoples overran the Ponto-Caspian plains from the east and countered those Germanic kingdoms while also taking blows at Byzantine hegemony. After the Huns in the 5th century, the next of these steppe peoples was the Avars. They were on the run from Gokturks, their former subjects, who now controlled virtually all of the Eurasian steppe belt. But the Gokturk Khaganate disintegrated in the 7th century. The Avars, meanwhile, solidified their rule in Central Europe. In between, many steppe peoples roamed freely. This includes the Majars. The earliest mention of the Majar tribes in Europe was in 836 as allies of the Bulgarians, who were waging war against Byzantium. A few years later, raiding Majars were already located in the Frankish realm. In a letter from Archbishop Theotmar of Salzburg to the Pope, he mentioned that the Moravians had hired many Majar warriors as mercenaries against the Franks. It seems that the Majars' military prowess was both feared and envied before they had even established their own state in Europe. We can, however, reconstruct the migration of the Majars with accuracy. As mentioned, they were living either south of the Ural or in modern-day Bashkortostan. At the end of the 6th century, they moved southwest and occupied the place of the Bulgar groups, who, in turn, had left to join the Onagur Federation. In the Kuban Don region, the Majars came into contact with the Hazars. As the Bulgars established Old Great Bulgaria in modern-day Ukraine, as we explored recently, they lost against a coalition of Hazars and Majars and were forced to give up their settlements. As the Hazars expanded their territory to include the Crimean Peninsula, the Majars in turn slowly occupied the territory between the Dnieper and the Lower Danube. 
Until recently, it was assumed that this area was called Levadia, named after Levadi, the first known leader of all Majars. Andras Ronatas, however, assumes that Levadia and the so-called Etelko state were encompassing the very same area, with Levadia simply denoting the eastern part of this realm. Between 750 and 850, the Majars remained neighbors and allies of the Hazars and helped, as Byzantine Emperor Constantine VII remarked, against all of the Hazars' enemies in battle. This alliance was not necessarily on equal footing, but it seems that Hazar's rule over Levadia was only formal from 800 onward. During this time, several hundred Turkic loanwords which had been brought forward by the Gukturks to the Hazars found their way to the Majar vocabulary. By now, the Majars had certainly become known for their military prowess. To give an example, an envoy of the Rus people to Constantinople had to make a complete halt and return to the north due to so-called primitive tribes that were very fierce and savage, referring to the Majars. But this seemingly steadfast alliance faded. In the 820s, a revolt broke out in the Hazar Khaganat, initiated by three Hazar tribes who rebelled against the leadership. The tribes were forced to leave the empire, with some members migrating to the Rus Empire in the north and others moving to Levedia. Called Kabar, these Turkic warriors joined the Majar Tribal Confederation and became known as the Eight Majar Tribe. The inclusion of rebellious tribes by the Majars strained their relationship with the Hazars. By 830, this relationship turned hostile. Ahmad ibn Rusta, a Persian explorer from Isfahan, remarked that the Hazars had been protected from Majar and other invading forces by building a large fort in Sarkel. Clearly, the Majar-Hazar alliance was over. But the Majars, as well as their new Kabar allies, had to leave Levadia in 850. The Kangli, a branch of the Turkic Tolis tribal federation that had once joined the Guk Turks in their campaigns, suddenly migrated westward. In truth, they had been expelled by the Hazars from their homeland in western Kazakhstan. The Kangli were situated near or within the realm of the Pecheneg, an up-and-coming tribe of the Turk Oguz people, which was also making its way forward the Ponto-Caspian steppe. Emperor Constantine, once again writing about these events in his book On the Administration of the Empire, remarked that the Majars did resist the invasion, but lost in battle. This ultimately led to their split into two groups. One part went eastwards, towards the Turkic Pecheneg realm, which, to our understanding, wouldn't make much sense. Why should the Majars flee to those who invaded their country and tried to kill or even enslave them? Constantine even claimed that they would have migrated to the Caucasus, which was precisely ruled by even more tribes hostile to the Majars. But the other part, led by the actual high chieftain, definitely settled further west, in the historical area known as Itelkus. Like the Bulgarians a century earlier, the Majars had decided to become fully independent of the chaotic situation of the Western Steppe Belt, albeit forced to make that decision. Etelkos thus became the first formidable Majar state in Europe. For nearly four decades, it was ruled by the dynasty of Arpad, who we mentioned before. The first ruler of Etelkos, however, was Almos. The Majars, by now, had taken the idea of a dual kingship from the Hazars, as indicated by al jaihani a Persian scholar and politician of the Samanid Empire in Central Asia. Whether Almos was a secular military ruler or a sacred ruler, the so-called Kende, is open for debate. According to the Gesta Hungarorum by Simon of Keza, Almos was freely elected by the chieftains of the seven tribes who swore an oath, confirmed in a pagan manner, with their own blood spilled in a single vessel. Emperor Constantine, on the other hand, claims that the Hazars had pressured Levedi, the former ruler, to transfer power to Almos and his family, thereby ending the Levedi dynasty and putting the Majar confederation into the position of a Hazar vassal. The origins of both Levedi and Almos are mysterious in nature, 
as only little information has survived. But there are a few clues about their ancestral history. Simon of Kaza remarked that Almos came from the House of Turul. Remember the mythical bird that we showed earlier? This Turul, part of Hungarian and Turkic mythology, was central for the biography of Almos. According to legend, Almos's mother, Emisi, already pregnant with him, dreamed of a bird of prey, which had the likeness of a hawk, impregnating her. At his birth, a hawk akin to Turul is indeed said to have been present. Both Master P, an anonymous writer during the era of Bela III, as well as Simon of Kaza, drew a parallel to Attila the Hun, whom they remarked to have carried a banner with the likeness of a hawk. Thus, Almos was seen as a descendant of Attila. Taking these mythical legends aside, the names of both Almos and his mother, Emis, indicate a mix of Finno-Ugric and Turkic elements, as we theorized earlier. The name Almos was probably of Turkic origin, while Emis was a name of Finno-Ugric tradition. Yet the name Turul has an unclear origin. Aside from a shared Hungarian-Turkic tradition, no Turulid dynasty was ever recorded for the Huns or anyone else. Remember that in our recent video, we remarked that the ancestral tribe of Kubrak Khan and his Bulgars was called Dulu or Tuluk in Turkic. This tribe was actually a group of 10 tribes that ruled over one half of the Western Turkic Khaganat in the seventh century, with the Nushibi ruling over the other half. At most, one could see a parallel between the Tuluk and the Turul dynasty originating in Western Asia and reappearing in Europe. However, aside from shared migratory history and similar sounding names, Tuluk and Turul probably had no other common traits. In 895, the Majar tribes were once again attacked by the Pechenegg. Under military pressure from these nomadic Turks and under political pressure by the Hazars, who, with Ogu's help, had driven out the Pechenegg further to the west, the Majars were forced to migrate once again. Arpad, son of Almos, the new high prince of all Majar tribes, led his people across the Carpathian Mountains into the area now known as Hungary. The Carpathian Basin, also known as the Pannonian Basin, being surrounded by the Carpathian Mountains and the Alps, presents a natural fortress that is strategically positioned in Central Europe. The basin's rivers, including the Danube and Tisza, enhance its agricultural potential and provide crucial trade routes. Entering this region, the Majars encountered a political landscape marked by small Slavic principalities and remnants of the Avar which had controlled the region but was destroyed by the Franks under leadership of Charlemagne in 822. Arpad's first major victory was against Berengar, King of Italy, at the Battle of Brenta River in 899, after which the Majars advanced even further and raided Treviso, Bergamo, Milan, and other settlements in Italy. Next, Arpad defeated Braslav, Prince of the Slavs, to take complete control over Pannonia. Then, the Majars advanced to the north and defeated the Moravians, completely destroying their Slavic state. The Majars permanently occupied their settlements from 902 or 903 onward. But conquest alone does not make for a great ruler. As the Majars had driven away all hostile forces from Pannonia, Arpad consolidated his state. Master P made some remarks about Arpad's forces entering a quincum, which he called the city of King Attila. From these remarks, it becomes clear that Arpad took care of his companions and possibly even gained new allies in the region by fairly distributing lands and goods. But Majars raided not only Italy and Pannonia, which they permanently took from the Moravians and whatever had remained of the Avars. They raided as far as the Emirate of Cordoba in Spain, Britannia on the Atlantic Ocean, and even sent a small expedition force to the city of Bremen in northern Germany. Including Italy and the Balkans, the Majars raided almost all of Western and Southern Europe, 
thereby also engaging in warfare against the Bulgars and Byzantium. Between 907 and 910, they even defeated three large Frankish armies, withstanding any counterattacks. These raids endured at least until 955, when the Magyars were defeated by the Holy Roman Emperor Otto, the Battle of Leschfeld in modern-day Francia in Germany. Out of 47 raids, between 895 and 970, 37 were successful. That is an 80% success rate. The Magyar's violent and frequent raiding was reminiscent of the terror once inspired by Attila and his Huns, and it played a significant role in the geopolitical dynamics of early medieval Europe. Despite facing the decisive defeat at Lechfeld, the Magyars consolidated their power in the region rather than disintegrating, eventually leading to the establishment of the medieval kingdom of Hungary. Prince Arpad died between 903 and 907. His legacy cannot be understated as all rulers of Hungary for centuries to come claimed descent from the house of Arpad. The ancient sources attribute all events of the Hungarian land taking in Pannonia to him. Next, Zoltan, followed as new Grand Prince of the Magyars. His rule lasted until 947 and saw even more conflicts both against other states that we mentioned, as well as against the Khabars who had joined the Magyars a few decades earlier. The last Grand Prince of the Magyars was Istvan, or Stephen, who became the first King of Hungary in the year 1000, adopting Christianity as the state religion in the process. This marks the end of ancient Magyar history and the beginning of the Christian kingdom of Hungary. The Magyar conquests had long lasting effects on the geopolitical and even cultural dynamics of Europe. For example, by conquering Pannonia, they divided the Slavic settlement into Southern and Northern sections and formed a linguistic borderland between Slavic and West Germanic speakers in the process. But we want to dedicate the last chapter of this documentary to a different topic, to one that we mentioned at the beginning of this video. With all the information that we have just given, with all the migrations, cultural influences, and events considered, we want to finally answer the following question. Were the Magyars a Hunic people? This topic has been extensively debated in academia for decades and even centuries with differing results. Given the sources that we used for this video, the books of Simon of Kaza, Anonymous Master P, and the work of Emperor Constantine VII, it does seem logical to think of the Magyars as descendants of the Huns of Attila. Yet, the circumstances under which those books were written reveal an interesting component of the medieval and even modern Hungarian mythical ethos. Remember that Hungarian is a language isolated in Central and Eastern Europe. The languages nearest to it are Finno-Ugric, and located far away to the north and northeast, respectively. A portion of the Hungarian language further contains loan words from Turkic, some of which were taken during the Ottoman era, but many of which can be dated back to the Gokturk and Hazar eras. We need to consider that, while the Hungarians are majority Christian now and have been for centuries, they were originally neither Christian nor adherent to any other Abrahamic faith with elements from Turkic, Iranic, and even Nordic cultures finding their place within Hungarian cosmology. And going back to the Magyars in Kazakhstan, even DNA analysis points to some form of Turkic admixture among the Hungarians. While medieval Hungarians did not have the possibility to extract all of the information that we explored so far, they were very much conscious about their presence in Europe as outsiders. But why is that important to consider? Because there is another group of steppe people that was also considered as being outsiders, as invaders from Asia, the Huns. Crossing the Caucasus Mountains in 395, they staged large-scale attacks on the Persian Empire in the Near East and on tribes and kingdoms in Europe simultaneously. Their European contemporaries already painted them in a very bleak light, even describing them as inhuman monsters in some cases. The ancient sources did, however, also describe the culture and politics of the Huns without biased language. 
In that regard, the Huns and the ancient Hungarians show a lot of similarities. Both were a steppe people from Asia. Both were skilled in horse archery, using almost the same tactics several centuries apart. Both adhered to non-Abrahamic shamanist practices, and both peoples lastly settled in the Pannonian Basin. While the Majars included some Turkic admixture, we can even trace the origins of the core tribe of the Huns of Attila back to the Altai Mountains around 300 AD. On a linguistic and even genetic level, it is clear that the Huns were a Turkic people, belonging to the Oguric branch that also included the Onogur tribes and the Bulgars later on. But the same can be said about other peoples and states. For example, about the Guk Turks, with whom the Hazars and Majars were switched in sources, including the book of Emperor Constantine VII. And what about the Avars? These people who used to dwell between the Ponto-Caspian steppe and the Ural Mountains were either partly or fully taken over by Ruran remnants from East Asia and created their kingdom precisely in the same area as the Huns and Majars. Nonetheless, there are two more elements that convinced many scholars and chroniclers, not just among the Hungarians themselves, but virtually across all of Europe, of a Hunnic Majar connection. First, the name. As we mentioned, the name Hungary stems from a deviation of Onagur. As the Majars used to settle in the same area that was known as Onagur land for at least three centuries, they were thought of being of Onagur stock. Onagur became Ungur and Hongur among Frankish writers, and lastly Hungar and German sources, with Hungary being the commonly used name of the Magyar nation. In Turkey, interestingly, Hungary is known as Magyaristan. It seems that the parallel between the names Hun and Hungary is purely coincidental. The second element is a shared stock of myths that were, by medieval scholars, attributed to both the Huns and the Hungarians. To give an example, Simon of Kaza gave the first account of the so-called legend of Hunor and Magor. According to his Gesta Honorum et Hungarorum, Hunor and Magor, who are often depicted as brothers or twins, are the ancestors of the Huns and the Magyars, respectively. The story begins with the brothers participating in a great hunt where they pursue a miraculous stag, which leads them across various lands. Eventually, the stag disappears, and they find themselves in a new territory, which they claim as their own. The tale symbolizes the wandering nature of these ancient peoples and their journey to the land that would become Hungary. It emphasizes themes of adventure, exploration, and destiny, highlighting the divine guidance in their migratory origins. This myth is an integral part of Hungarian national identity encapsulating the historical and mythological beginnings of the nation. It is impossible to refute such a legend that was taken in by later scholars and even the common people of Hungary as a celebratory way of connecting the Kingdom of Hungary with the ancient Hun Empire and on a broader scope with nomadic steppe warriors from the East. Did Simon of Keza invent this story? Did he perhaps combine two similar tales that were present among the Huns and the Hungarians, respectively? We can neither prove nor disprove the existence of this legend among the Huns. Nonetheless, these and other tales seem like a noble effort to make clear that the Hungarians were the successors of the Huns. And in a way, they were both politically and culturally. However, in between, the Avars and other groups like the Onagur are almost completely ignored. In conclusion, the connection between Huns and Hungarians seems interesting to say the least. However, a direct succession on a genetic level cannot be stated. It seems more likely that the Majars, those who conquered the Pannonian Basin, had Finno-Ugric and Turkic admixture. This includes the Nganasan people who were native to Northern Siberia. However, on a political and cultural level, the Majars can indeed be linked with the Avars, the Huns, and virtually all other steppe peoples who invaded Europe from the 4th to the 10th centuries. All these peoples shared a very similar way of life, similar creation myths and legends, similar mentalities and tactics in warfare. What sets them apart is the language. 
Therefore, we can precisely say that the Majars were originally part of the Finno-Ugric groups at the Ural Mountains. They intermixed with Turkic and possibly Iranic peoples, in the process taking some of the latter's cosmological elements, while also getting into closer contact with Nordic peoples. As the Majars arrived in Europe, they fought against virtually everyone and anyone. The absence of contemporary sources about leaders such as Levedi and Arpaad makes the Majars' arrival in Pannonia all the more mysterious. Yet, it is clear that they stand in a line that began with the Huns of Attila, continued with the Avar Khaganate, and culminated in the establishment of the Hungarian Kingdom in the year 1000 AD. But the Majars are only one of many interesting peoples that emerged in the Eurasian steppe belt. The Gokturks and the Hazars also created mighty empires, albeit further to the east, that left an everlasting impact on Eurasian history. Check out their respective videos. And don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you won't miss any updates. Lastly, consider becoming a member here on YouTube or on Patreon. Depending on the level chosen, you will receive exclusive status updates and even early access to new videos.